alongside our partners, the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation and the Northwest Montana Forest Fire Lookout Association. Um, we are all groups that are dedicated to wilderness, dedicated to conservation, and excited to learn more from some knowledgeable minds tonight about fisheries and the underwater world of the Bob Marshall. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to start tonight with a short film called Hallowed Waters. We will travel to the south side of the Bob. Um, tonight we'll be spending our, most of our time learning about the um, river systems in the northern part of the Bob, but we're gonna visit the Blackfoot and Clearwater watersheds with this short film, um, Hallowed Waters, presented by the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Project. The Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Project is a collaborative group um, out of Seedy Lake, Montana. They are a group of local citizens, recreational users, conservationists, um, local timber industry is even involved, who have come together uh, to conserve and protect um, this special place in the Southern Bob area. And they recently released this new film called Hallowed Waters. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for joining us.
black and clear water stewardship act is critically important to maintaining the quality long term of the entire watershed there's a lot of sections of the watershed that are in great shape but with great opportunities for them to lose that great conditions and can be open for development. We all have the same goal in mind. We want to maintain this. We want to be able to experience it. We don't want to change it into something else. We don't, we don't want to lose it. And that river is what brings us together, whether you're a fifth generation rancher, whether you're a logger, whether you're a retiree who just kind of happened to fall in love driving up Highway 200, and it's high time that the Black Clear Clearwater Stewardship Act gets passed, and we've been waiting for this and working on this for over a decade. We have inherited this incredible legacy, and the Black Clear Clearwater Stewardship Act allows us to pass it on. for joining us again at the Women's Speaker Series. Um, the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act has been introduced to Congress um, by Senator Tester two years ago, and he's considering introducing it again. So if you would like to sign on in support of this project, um, we have an open letter, um, petition style, outside on clipboards. Um, please see me after the program if you'd like to learn more about it and um, help us protect some of these vital fisheries. So thank you, and uh, without further ado, we'll, we will move on to our speakers now and learn more about the pristine fisheries elsewhere in the bog. So I will start uh, with a few introductions. We have Matt Boyer with us. He is... Um, the Science Program Supervisor at FWP. He's worked with FWP in fisheries since 2002. He's currently managing the fisheries fish mitigation programs on the Libby and Hungry Horse dams, and he's previously worked in the Wasatch Cache National Forest in Utah on um, wilderness work and on trail crew. So please welcome Matt. Do you want to come on up? <laughs> Jim's going to go first. Well, yeah, yeah, just, so. hello. We'll hear from Matt later. <laughs> okay. Um, well, then I'll introduce Jim. Why don't you step right up here? All right. <laughs> so Jim uh, Vashro is also with us. He's a retiree, uh, retired, excuse me, um, regional fisheries manager for FWP. He worked for FWP for 39 years, 30 of those years as regional fisheries manager. Um, he retired in 2013, but he still remained involved. He's on the board of the Montana Wildlife Federation, and he's also the president of Flathead Wildlife. So um, please welcome Jim. But one second, because I still have to introduce Leo. So we have one more fisheries expert with us tonight. Um, <laughs> we have the whole gamut. Um, so Leo Rosenthal is also with us. Hello, Leo. Um, <laughs> He is the fisheries management biologist on the South Fork and the Middle Fork of the Flathead and the Swan with FWP as well. Um, he's originally from Butte. He's lived all over Montana. He um, got his bachelor's from University of Montana in Missoula and then went on to his master's in Bozeman at Montana State where he studied uh, little prairie fish, as he just told me, um, and the tributaries of the Yellowstone all the way out in Glendive. So he's truly a citizen of the state. He's lived and worked and fished across the entire state, and I'm looking forward to hearing what these fine fisheries experts have to say. Thanks for joining us. All right. Yeah, it yeah, sounds like everybody can hear me. Well, I'm at that point where they're starting to ask me to, to do the historical perspective, so, uh, and tonight we're going to talk about 35 years of fisheries management back in what we know as the Bob. Uh, and uh, it's a neat story. I'm going to talk about how the wilderness fishing rigs came to be. Then Leo's going to talk about the 
challenges and opportunities of managing ESA listed bull trout back in the bog. And then Matt will finish up <coughs> with a discussion of the uh, South Fork West Slope Cutthroat Conservation Project to ensure the genetic integrity of that population. And all of these, much like the South of Blackfoot, occur at a watershed or an ecosystem level, and that, that makes them somewhat unique. <clears throat> so, uh, Bob Marshall, or wilderness fisheries, fishing and hunting as potentially consumptive activities would seem to be a little bit at odds with uh, an area untrammeled by man. On the other hand, fishing and hunting are probably the oldest human activities in the area we know as the Bob, uh, going back thousands of years. And uh, most of the studies I've seen by the Forest Service indicate that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the people that go into the South Fork have fishing as one of their primary activities. So the challenge for us as fisheries managers, how do we manage fish and fishermen and fisheries management in a way that's consistent with wilderness values? And we'll, we'll go through some of those. So we'll see if we do this. Uh, Anything that happens back there, we're talking 35 years of just a huge team effort. And I'm just going to touch on a few. I feel bad I can't cover everybody, but um, a few notables. Dick Vincent was the person who started wild trout management in Montana, and uh, that transferred over to the South Fork and the Bob very well. Uh, Joe Houston was one of the early fisheries biologists here, and, and Joe was pretty prescient in that he recognized cutthroat were hurting both in abundance and distribution now, and also their genetic integrity was being threatened by non-native fish. So Joe and another fellow by the name of Kevin, Kevin Sage <coughs> did a lot of the early genetic sampling back in the bog to lay out where work needed to be done. Uh, fisheries crew, they've done a lot of fish bolts. Uh, Bob, and Lynn, Bob Domrose and Lady Hansel did a lot of the early fisheries work. Uh, and they were replaced by uh, Scott Rumsey, who worked for South Fork for 20-some years. Uh, Grant Resack was the one who started on the Cutthroat Conservation Project, laid out a lot of the uh, uh, details on how to do the work and where it needed to be done, and, and was replaced eventually by Matt. John Fraley, who's wandered around here somewhere, uh, got his fingers into all of that, <coughs> and was also did some epic one-man journeys all the way through the Bob gathering fisheries data. So, Tom Weaver is known as Mr. Bullchow. Uh, we've really got some talented people that have worked out there, and, and Tom has been at the forefront of most bullchow work that's been done. Uh, as we got into replenishing some of the stocks, uh, lakes and such, uh, we were able to use the state's uh, general cutthroat root stock, but it soon became apparent that we would need some custom root stocks. And with the hatcheries, Mark Cornick and Scott Relier were very important in uh, assisting in getting uh, live cutthroat brought out, and they rear them and spawn them, and then their progeny would go back. And that was to maintain some of the genetic variation that was back in there. Lots of other folks. The, uh, we were very fortunate to have the University of Montana Wild Trout and Salmon uh, Genetics Lab. Uh, Fred Allendorf and, and Rob Leary are uh, leaders in fish genetics in the world. Rob looks like somebody you'd probably meet back in the bog. <laughs> he, he hasn't improved much in the years. Uh, but they really helped guide us in where we need to do some genetic work. Forest Service was a big partner in this. Uh, when I started, Dave Owen uh, was the ranger back in Spotted Bear. Deb Muckle is here somewhere. And uh, as a partner, unfortunately, they got drug into a lot of our environmental analyses, sort of about that. But they were also real important in terms of getting uh, resources, supplies, and people back in there, and providing backcountry cabins for the survey crews. Uh, backcountry had folks like uh, Gordon Ash and Guy Zellner, who again helped with a lot of logistics back there. Uh, packers, those guys are amazing, getting where they can get materials around and on time and in the right places. Uh, and I saw Pat Van Iron, I forgot to throw him up here. Pat was the forest fisheries biologist that helped quite a bit too. And the others, uh, <clears throat> again, we had to move a lot of materials in and out of the bog. And the backcountry horsemen of the Flathead were always a great partner. Andy Breland and Chuck Allen were the guys I worked with, but there were lots of other folks. So 
a lot of people care about the Bob and really pitch in to help make these kind of things happen. So, South Fork Flathead, there's a piece of heaven right there. Uh, that's its uh, big prairie. Just before we headed over to get some cookies and tang. Uh, and uh, what an amazing fishery. <coughs> so, uh, just a little talk about statewide fishing raids. Uh, the 40s and 50s, statewide uh, fishing limit for trout was 15 fish. Late 50s, they dropped it to 15, but no more than 10 cutthroat. There was a little inkling that things weren't going well for cuts. And then in the 60s and 70s, uh, a little hard to understand, 10 pounds, one fish, not more than 10 fish, which basically meant everybody was keeping 10 fish. And we were starting to realize that there was a little uh, concerns about cutthroat that were going down in abundance. And uh, 82, and I got here in 1981, uh, we dropped the limit to five cutthroat. And then in 83, and we'll talk about more why, why this happened, we reduced it more to five, only one could be over 14. And that was across the Western District. <clears throat> so as I said, I got here in 81, and the first thing I heard from a lot of people was the South Fork fishing is going to hell, and you gotta do something about it. And, and to be honest, my first thought was, boy, a lot of that's 20 miles from anywhere. How could it really be getting hit that hard? Uh, and we were hampered because there wasn't a whole lot of information back there. There'd been some general surveys. We knew where fish were in general. Uh, a lot of that was done by hook and line, so we just knew they were where they were. In 1980, there was a big snorkel survey that was the precursor of the bottom of the power projects. And, but that was doing more relative abundance in various sections. <clears throat> so, I mean, I didn't have a lot of information to gauge just where that fishery was headed. A couple of things I did have at our disposal. One, the state does a statewide mail creel survey. Send out questionnaires, and anglers can say where they fish and how much and all that, and then the, the machine crunches it back. And you get a general idea of where people fish. Uh, 58, 2,700 days back in the South Fork. Uh, this one got my attention, 82, 11,000 days fishing in the South Fork. I'm going to talk about that. It was probably a data artifact, but that one got my attention. That's 430 days of fishing per mile back in the bottom. That was a lot. Uh, the other thing at my disposal, there are a number of volunteers that, that run what's called the Volunteer uh, Angler Lodge Program. Uh, six to eight hundred folks, and they keep track of their fishing, and we crunch the data. There weren't a lot of reports to the South Fork. But those that were reporting from 1950 to about 1980 said there was about a two inch decrease in the average size of fish they were catching. So that told me something was going on. <clears throat> and uh, so the question is, what are we gonna do about it? And uh, of course the Bob's a pretty big country. Um, and where I'm getting to is we needed two pieces of information. We needed to know how many fish were back there and what sizes and what fishermen were doing when they were back there fishing for them. And this is the format, but basically we ended up for a creel cert, well, for a population estimate, we ended up at Mid Creek, which is about four or five miles upstream from the wilderness boundary. It was just what we could get to the easiest, uh, and just to find out what the populations looked like. Creel survey was a little more challenging because Anglers are coming in and out of the bog in all directions. <clears throat> and uh, and this was a typical state fisheries project, no money and no personnel. So, you know, <laughs> so what, how can we get our hands, our arms around what's going on there? Talking to a lot of people that knew the bog, what we decided to do is run a creel check station down here, but downstream of uh, Spotted Bear, either on the east side road or right where the river came, the, Bridge came across over to the west side road, and then over in Owl Creek, uh, Holland Lake. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we managed to, to do all that. So, <clears throat> and there again, pot, we needed a population estimate, how many fish are there, and a creel survey. What are anglers doing back there? So, uh, as I said, we did Mid Creek. Uh, normally we do what's called a mark recapture estimate. And basically you catch as many fish as you can you mark, and mark them in some way so you can identify them, uh, release them, let them mix back randomly. You grab another sample and you look at what percentage are marked. And so rough estimate, 
You mark 100 fish, when you recapture 10% of the fish are marked, then the original population was 10 times the 100 fish or 1,000 fish. And it's a little more elegant than that with the computers, but basically that's what we're doing. Well, our typical sampling uh, involves generators and batteries and all that. And obviously, I wouldn't even work in the wilderness. Plus, the South Fork is so big and so pure, it wouldn't work anyway. And, uh, but we thought, well, everything we hear is a cutthroat or easy to catch. So yeah, it's a, it was a tough job. We decided to sample them by hook and line. Uh, took a, used travel limited volunteers, walked in, fished for two days, did a small fin flick, let them mix for a week, went back and recaptured. <clears throat> and what we came up with is an estimate of just over a thousand cutthroat per mile uh, there at Mid Creek. Uh, but most of them were fairly small. Only 3% of them were over 12 inches. <clears throat> So that was a little discouraging from what I heard about the South Fork. Uh, later population estimates, because there's some assumptions, you have to assume your recapture uh, that the fish aren't avoiding. And so the concern was, well, if we use hook and line to capture them, are they going to avoid when we go back to recapture? <clears throat> and to get around that kind of a bias, later estimates went to snorkel samples. And this is my Sasquatch picture. Uh, these are some of our guys. Leo is one of those in there. Uh, and so we marked them by hook and line, and then they would actually snorkel down through, and, and the south port is so clear you can count the fish very well. The other thing, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, <coughs> went to, because when you're snorkeling, you can't really tell, they got a little uh, fin clip, went to a small plastic tag that actually got sewn onto the back of the fish and it was colored and we broke the, the sizes of the fish up by size length and as the snorkelers were going through they'd count the fish and classify them by size. Uh, also rather than mid creek we standardized the two long term sessions at Black Bear and Harrison Creek just below Meadow Creek. <clears throat> and there you can you can just see the guys coming down that's the mouth of Gordon Creek there they're just coming down come down to rest and they pretty well uh, get, they, you can get an amazingly good count on what's coming through there. So, Okay, so we did a creel survey. Um, we did one week and one weekend day through the summer, a little shorter when uh, we looked at Owl Creek because you couldn't get in there in June very well. Uh, we actually did 326 interviews with a thousand anglers that fished 1,800 days. Pretty good fishing back there. Um, when we expanded that, we estimated that anglers that summer had fished 4,500 days. They caught just about 7,500 cutthroat. And of that, they harvested 4,500, about half of them. So it was a pretty good harvest rate, about 89 per mile. Uh, it, it, based on mid creek with 1,000 fish, that was an 8% uh, harvest rate. It wasn't that bad, but we'll show you later Mid Creek's pretty high in most places, are only 600 to 700 trout per mile. So we're talking more about 15% or more. This is the part that, that uh, was a little worrisome. Fishermen like to keep big fish, go figure. Uh, a third of what they were killing was over 12 inches. And remember, we only saw 3% of the population that was over 12. So something was happening there. <clears throat> so based on that, uh, we've got a population estimate, pretty skimpy data, and we've got um, a creel survey that says, okay, fishermen are working over those bigger fish pretty hard. And remember, the general limit was five fish. Oop, 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 oh, I hit the wrong one. There we go. Uh, five fish, only one over 14. I wasn't sure how fishermen would accept a lot of major changes. So I came in and say, all right, let's try something like five cutthroat, only one over 12 inches. Here was the interesting part. Citizens came back to me, backcountry anglers, and it was led by an outfitter, but uh, uh, had a lot of, had the university, had a lot of backcountry anglers, and they said, that's not good enough. Uh, at the time, Yellowstone Lake had a, a regulation of three less than 12 inches, and they said, this is where we think the South Fork should go. And the, the rationale they got, gave was 312 inches is enough for a meal, and it, you know, being able to eat, eat a meal back there is important, but that's enough for anybody for a meal. That's about the size that cutthroat starts spawning, uh, so it protects the spawning size fish, and it protects the bigger fish, which would hopefully restore the, the quality of fishing. And at that point, I made a really good 
decision, and I said, I'm going to step aside, you guys can do it, and I will support you. Uh, they built a very impressive uh, body of support for it and got the Fish and Game Commission to adopt it. <coughs> and uh, there was one exception to that, uh, and we adopted it, everything upstream of Hungry Bush Reservoir. So the whole upper, upper drainage, we made the one exception, there were 10 lakes back in there that were stock fished, and, and we uh, pulled those out and left them under the 5 under 1 over, uh, one over 14. And that became known as the wilderness limit, and it went into effect May of 1984. So, pretty cool stuff. Uh, almost immediately, what we saw is the number of cutthroat, and the place we were looking about doubled. Uh, and the percent of cutthroat that we were sampling went up to 30% or so. So, and that meant the average length increased uh, two inches. And so folks started saying, hey, the good old days are back. But the biggest complaint we heard was, it's, it's hard to catch anything small enough to eat back there. It's a heck of a, that's a good problem to have. <clears throat> so we made a couple of other changes over the next few years. One, uh, wardens checking anglers coming out of, say, Hungry Horse, hard to tell where they come from. And, and really, the whole drainage functions the same way, and those fish mix a bit. So we extended that wilderness limit all the way down to Hungry Horse Dam. And what we standardized at is anything in the streams, and the tributaries to Hungry Horse are also spawning populations. Anything in the stream, 312 inches. The lakes are more productive, many of them are stocked. <coughs> so you can have three of any size. <clears throat> and uh, a few years later, uh, I tried to extend the wilderness regulation to all wilderness areas statewide, and I was within 12 hours. Uh, and there was concern about uh, <coughs> the Azorki Beartooth. There were all introduced populations, a lot of fish that weren't indigenous, and they objected. And rather than just removing them from the regulation, they pulled the whole thing back. And I could never get the momentum again. But eventually, uh, this same three fish limit was adopted for cutthroat and western fishing districts. So that really is for the western wilderness areas. That is the, uh, uh, the regulation back there now. And there's a the result. Uh, you know, I think uh, being able to eat a, a meal of fish back there is pretty important. This was around Bartlett Creek, and uh, it took us over an hour to get four fish under 12 inches. We had to release 15 of them. Process. So uh, those are all 11 and a half. I know they look like <laughs> they're 11 and a half inches. But you know, being able to uh, eat a meal to me is, is a real important connection back there. <clears throat> and uh, so the question is does it do any good? We saw an immediate response. Does it last? Uh, when we look at angling use, and again, that's the uh, statewide male trio. And then remember, I said when I was looking at 11,000, I think that was high because when you look at uh, succeeding years was more like this gradual increase. 2000, and I'm, I'm missing a bunch of years. 2005, we saw a peak, but I think this is where it's about uh, leveled out now with nine to 10,000 days of fish, and about four times of what we saw back when we did this initial work. So the South Fork gets a lot of use, <clears throat> but when we look at some of our longer term uh, sampling areas, this one was done shortly after the regulation was put into effect. This is all the way up the upper end above Big Prairie with Gordon Brownstone. Uh, and if you see the number of fish, uh, 87, about 300, uh, then that jumped to about 700. And then just last summer, uh, it was all the way up to 900. So it's shown an upwards, upwards bounce. That may be in part this latest one, the response to uh, uh, the fires and the upper drainage and some of the high flow years, but things are looking good. The fishery's holding on. Uh, the South Fork black bear is a little more typical, and, and as I said, a thousand fish is too high, but you can see black bear runs 500, 600, and through the last 20 some years, uh, the fishery's holding up very well. So uh, I think we did some good things with that regulation. The, uh, you know, protecting both the quality of the fishery, the quality of the spawning population, and providing some, some nice meals out there. I'll just finish up with a thought on cutthroat vulnerability, and uh, oh, God love cutthroat. You know, it's a, they're a good one to start somebody out fishing on. When we're doing these population estimates by hook and line, if we 
really worked hard in a section. For two days, we can mark up to 30% of the population in that area. So you can, you can really catch cutthroat. <coughs> And I mentioned this, this was actually a John Fraley fish. I mentioned that we're marking fish now with these little crustacean tags, they're called. So we catch them, we handle them, we put this tag in, and they each have an individual number on them. So it's quite a bit of handling on them. And John did that to a fish, turned it loose, and if I'm right, John, caught the same fish five minutes later or something. Yeah, <laughs> <that's weird>. yeah. <laughs> and the next day he came down, caught it again. And so, uh, but you, you know, cutthroat are very vulnerable. You've got to love them, but you do need to be a lot more conservative with cutthroat. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leo to talk about the joys of managing bull trout back in the bog. And we're going to do, we'll do uh, questions at the end. We'll keep moving. Second way that we monitor is, is we do every other year we do gillnets and hungry horse reservoir. 
These are standardized nets in both location as well as timing. And this samples those H3 plus bull trout. So these are fish that have uh, reared in the tributaries and then made their way back down to the reservoir. But then really the biggest monitoring tool that we have for bull trout is the red test. And that, that, that monitors the adult bull trout that we have in the South Fork. Um, we do both index as well as base and wide red counts. We'll talk a bit more about that. One of the keys to this is we use experienced personnel. So, so lots of people, this is, you know, it's very obvious at times when you see these reds. And those of you that aren't familiar, some people talk about doing red counts and they think that I'm actually out there counting fish and gets back to salmon. And people think, oh, well, adult sockeyes are called red salmon, right? So you must be out there counting the fish. Well, no, we're actually counting reds, R-E-D. And it's a, it's a term that's used for these spawning depressions. So, so most trout, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, most trout pair up and the female digs a hole in the gravel that you can see there and then she lays her eggs and the male pairs up and fertilizes them and then she covers them back up with gravel. And these fish are big. They're coming out of the reservoir. They're 30 inches plus. They're doing it at a time in the fall when the water's very low and it's had a little bit of algae covering all the rock. And so when they did these depressions, yeah, you can see them. It, it's plain as day when we're out there. So this is a great tool that we have to monitor these fish. These fish are real easy to see when they're out there too. So the idea is, is to get out there when they're done spawning. But occasionally we get out there and we see them out there and we know that we're a little early. So we'd like to get complete counts all the time, but sometimes that doesn't happen. It's a great survey comparatively with a lot of the work that I do. Most of the work involves lots of equipment, like Jim was saying, generators, electrofishers, all these things. Bull trout red counts are great. This is all you need, some waders, some boots, some GPS, definitely a bear spray, uh, and, and not much else. Most people that I talk to, and they say, they say, man, you have a great job. That, that sounds great. You just walk down these streams. It's beautiful. You know, you're out in the woods. Man, I'd love to do what you do. But that's not what it looks like. Most of the time, it looks like that. And, and, and you get to me and say, oh, dear me. And, and then you get to that. And, and, or maybe it looks like that. So uh, this, is, this is challenging work. I'm not going to lie. It's tough to walk down these streams. Uh, and, and to find where these reds are is, is not an easy task. Uh, so the South Fork's a big place. Uh, the reservoir trips get counted every year. Those wilderness trips get counted every three to four years. And so periodically we do what's called a basin wide, which is even more than just the typical wilderness trips. That's only been done twice. <clears throat> and, and like I said, it's considerable effort to get these wilderness counts. Like everything else in the bog, we have to use horses. You know, I'm not a horse guy, but I play one at times. So uh, we get out there just like everyone else. And, and it's hard work. Uh, just to give you an example of what it takes to get one of these wilderness trips done, we do it with two crews. In this example, this was 2011, the North Crew does uh, big salmon, little salmon in the White River. Oops. South Crew did Gordon, Young's, uh, South Fork Main Stem we still do, some of Danaher as well as Babcock. And so one of our guys, Gary Michael, put some, some figures together and just to do it, we walked 71 miles of creek, uh, 93 miles of trail, and then 114 miles on horse. So that's just one year of doing this, and, and man, it's a lot of work. But it takes you to some great places, right? So so here's just quickly some of the drainages that we go to and some, some relative numbers of what the red counts are in those trips. So Big Salmon Lake has its own population of bull trout. These are fish that, that instead of going to Hungry Horse, they use Big Salmon Lake as their ocean, and then they migrate up into Big Salmon Creek to spawn. We get an average of about 70 reds there. Little Salmon Creek's another big one, big trip to the South Fork, 84 red average. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, so, so some work that John Fraley and Brad Shepard did in the, in the late 80s uh, looked at how many fish does it, does it take to make each red. And they did some trapping and then they did some red count. And, and long story short, it comes out to about 3.2 bull trout per red. So that gets you an idea of how many of these fish are going up. Uh, White River, great, great bull trout stream. Danaher Creek's kind of an interesting one. Beautiful drainage, huge stream, very few reds. So that shows how specific these the habitat is for these fish. So even though it looks just like the rest of them, uh, it doesn't have quite the right upwelling or groundwater influence that the rest of them do, and the bull trout, for one reason or another, don't use it. Question, is that per mile? No, that's for the entire uh, for the entire drainage. Okay. 
Yep. Uh, Gordon Crick's another big one that, that we have. And then, of course, Young's Crick's another big one. And, and like Jim said, you know, he kind of gave a shout out to a lot of these guys. And, and Tom Weaver is, is really the one. Jim mentioned that, that he's like Mr. Bull Trout, and he is. Tom's been doing this stuff since the early 80s. And, uh, you know, we're lucky to have him around working with us still. He's a huge mentor of mine, and, uh, and, and, and it's great to have him around. And, and it's not just Tom. You know, we talk about that what it's like to have experienced personnel counting this. It doesn't get more experienced than the guys that we have out there. John Fraley's been doing this forever. John Kabili, I know he's here. I've seen him up there. You know, these guys have been around and done this, and uh, they're as good as it gets. So I mentioned that we count those wilderness trips every, or the reservoir trips every year, and the wilderness trips periodically. And so when we look at that, we can do a simple correlation between the number of reservoir tributary red to the total number when we do the res reservoir and the wilderness. And there's a very tight correlation, and so that allows us to expand for the years where we're not doing those wilderness trips. Get an estimate of reds for the entire period. And here's what we see. So those black bars indicate years where we counted the wilderness trips and the reservoir trips, and the gray bars indicate years where we just counted the reservoir trips and then expanded it based on that correlation. Things, if you, if you have to ask me, I'd call that pretty flat. You know, There's a lot of variability where we see some high years, some low years, but overall I'd call that trend pretty flat. And so why does all of this matter? Why do we monitor these fish? Well, that's because we're providing this incredible bull trout fishery that's very rare and it's a, it's a unique experience that we have for the South Fork. So this fishery was reopened in 2004. When, when bull trout were first listed under ESA in 1998, uh, the only water that was left open to fishing for bull trout was Swan Lake. Uh, then in 2004, we were able to get a, a permit from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to reopen this fishery and allowed for take of up to 300 bull trout. So in Hungry Horse Reservoir, we had a, a harvest of two per year and allowed for catch and release in the South Fork. As part of that, having that fishery, as part of this permit, we were required to go to this catch card system and, and an angler survey so that we could get annual pressure and catch and harvest estimates for this fishery and keep a little bit tighter counts on what was going on. So we have some dates that these seasons are open for, uh, anglers report their catch and things like that on the catch card, and we get all this great information out of it. And here's what we've seen. Over the last number of years, participation's increased since to about 2011. And we see that as use is increasing on these rivers as well, but people are also more and more interested in catching these bull trout. Uh, we had a little bit of a change in 2009. You see that things came down a little bit. Anglers used to be able to get both the Kukanusa as well as the Hungry Horse catch card. Uh, then we said, well, we need to get better separation of the data, so we made them choose <coughs> one or the other. Saw a little bit of a decline there, but boy, ever since, it's really been increasing. Kind of some interesting data there. Uh, the blue line on the top is estimated angler days or estimated pressure for Hungry Horse Reservoir, and then the, the red is for the South Fork Flathead River itself. And for many years, we saw that the majority of bull trout anglers were by and large the guys fishing in the reservoir and to a lesser degree in the river. Up until this last couple of years where we've seen, yeah, there were fewer guys out there fishing in the reservoir, but more and more anglers wanting to fish for bull trout in the river. And we see that same kind of thing in the estimated catch that we get from this is we've seen less and less people catching fish in the reservoir and more and more people catching fish in the river. Uh, the good news is, even though we allow for two, uh, a harvest of two fish per year in the reservoir, most anglers are releasing those fish. Up to 80 or 90 percent of those fish are actually being released. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we do some gill netting, that every other year gill netting in the reservoir. Uh, so here you can see that, uh, you know, it appears, whoops, uh, it appears as though this fishery is sustainable. So we don't see much of a trend for the red counts. Although this next year is a basin wide year, so we'll get a better indication there. Uh, but with regard to the gill nets, you know, if, if anything, we've seen the number of bull trout increase since the 80s. So we'll continue to monitor this, but, but by and large, all things look pretty good for the bull trout. <coughs> so what are some future management issues that we're going to have in the South Fork? Well, you know, I see Scott Snelson sitting here, and, and the Forest 
Service is going through this uh, update of their comprehensive river management plan because they're seeing an increased amount of use out on the river. And so we know that there's more and more people using this, this river, whether it's pack rafters or guys like me that have these, these smaller boats. Yeah. Uh, and so we know the backcountry use has changed a little bit. We've seen that increased use of bull trout in the South Fork itself, more so than the reservoir. And so is this an indication that, that changes are coming? It could be. And, and so that's why we continue to monitor these things. And of course, then we have some other issues out there, right? One of which is more and more people are catching these fish. We see increased use on social media. Uh, I cringe a lot of times. I see lots and lots of photos on social media of people holding these fish up in the air. They're, they're you know, everybody wants to take a picture of big fish, but there's right and wrong ways to do it. And so uh, a couple of years ago, Mark Bellery and I put out this poster for how can we reduce the handling stress of fish? And, and there's a few different things you can do. One of which is, yeah, everybody wants to take that picture, but boy, there's great ways that you can take a great picture but leave the fish in the water. Another example is that picture I had of Jim. He had that fish in the water. He said, here, take my picture, and he lifted it up for a brief second and put it right back down. So this keep them wet campaign is a really good thing. Uh, and then one other thing that, you know, we're gonna have to start exploring as, as use increases, and we see more and more demand on these fish, things like terminal tackle regulation. Do we need to fish with travel boats? Things like that. Is there ways that we can be proactive, knowing that use is increasing out there, are there things that we can do to lessen the effects that we have on these fish? And I think that's all I have. So for my portion of tonight's seminar, um, I'm going to give an overview. Can, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay. I'm going to give an overview of this multi-year project that was made possible by uh, collaboration between uh, Forest Service and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, funding through Bonneville Power Administration through the Hungry Horse Mitigation Program, and lots of involvement from folks like you who are passionate and care deeply about this tremendous resource we're lucky to have right here. Um, but before I begin, I, I, I want to just step back and put this project in a bit of a broader wilderness context um, and say that back in the early 90s, right when the field of conservation biology was beginning to hit its full stride, this debate emerged about the value and role of wilderness in biodiversity conservation. And some authors suggested that um, really wilderness preservation should not be a surrogate for biodiversity conservation. They argue that on the basis that many of these wilderness areas, while they provide outstanding opportunities for solitude and such, many of them are in areas that are relatively species poor, um, such as these high alpine peak types. Other, other authors even put forward the idea that um, you know, sometimes will, um, human use or human land use or activities, because it's not detrimental to species conservation, the simple designation of wilderness to put in place um, restrictions that would prevent management actions that are actually beneficial to conserving species. So this is you know, not an ongoing debate, but um, I guess I would argue that more, much more often than not, wilderness areas are these critically important um, parcels of land that serve to promote and protect biodiversity. And they do that for a number of reasons. They're, they're areas where we allow these natural processes to occur that create habitats that support a full diversity of life. And there are also areas that, that can serve as very important critical refugia for our rare species. So the main character um, for the rest of my, my talk tonight 
is our state fish, Montana state fish, the West Slope Cutthroat Trout. It was scientifically discovered by Lewis and Clark uh, at the base of the Great Falls in Missouri um, when they caught a few of these fish for dinner, um, June 13th, 1805. Fast forward to present day, and quite a bit's changed. And you have trouble finding um, West Slope Cutthroat Trout in any section of this Missouri River. They've been extirpated for several decades. Historically, this is the, the, the historic distribution of the species that occupied large sections of western Montana and Idaho, up into BC and Alberta, also disjunct populations in sections of Oregon and Washington. Presently, though, we estimate they occupy less than 10% of their habitat in the US, about 20% of their habitat in the range in Canada. They're actually a, a listed species in Canada. And reasons for these these declines are varied. They include habitat degradation, habitat fragmentation in some portions of the, their range, especially in the Missouri River drainage, um, interactions with livestock, in particular red trampling play a role. And then across the range, interactions with introduced non-native fishes is a factor as well, whether it's pike or lake trout or, or brook trout. But the principal cause for the decline of this fish is undoubtedly um, interaction and hybridization with introduced rainbow trout. This is the world's most widely introduced fish. We put it on six of seven continents on this planet. And um, for a really interesting read, uh, kind of on the history of, of fish stocking, it, uh, changes in fish management paradigms, it suggests this book by Andrew Talverson. He wrote it as part of his dissertation uh, at Yale University. And then of course, at the root of this problem um, or issue, an issue um, is really just kind of the historic uh, fish management paradigms, utilitarian philosophy, and, and sort of long standing hatchery programs to create uh, harvest fisheries. Focusing in on Montana, um, the gray is the historic distribution of West Slope. Uh, despite its name, it's found on both the east and west of the, of the continental divide. Uh, the blue represents what we currently estimate is um, occupied by genetically pure um, fish, and those are the interconnected waters. And then the red hatched area is the South Fork Flathead drainage. And remarkably, that, that watershed comprises about 50% of what we have left for that species here in our state. So for you folks familiar with the South Fork, you'll know it's dotted with dozens of um, really, really beautiful high alpine lakes that provide refugia for, for native fishes. You'll know we've got miles and miles of cold, clean, uh, pristine uh, streams that serve as spawning and rearing habitat for those fish, which feed the South Fork Flathead River itself. And of course, that's a world-class destination for, for a West Slope Cutthroat Bull Trout. But despite the fact that the South Fork's a stronghold, um, still some issues. We've got the, the watershed here on the left hand side of your screen. Uh, it's the northern part of the watershed on the Norse Reservoir. The southern end is, in, is largely in the bottom or on the right hand side of the screen. And those red dots are alpine lakes that were historically fishless because they sit above barrier waterfalls. But <clears throat> decades ago, roughly between the 1920s and 1950s, they were stocked to provide recreational angling opportunities. All these lakes have surface connection to downstream waters, and so through time, these non-native Yellowstone and Rainbow were moving out of the lakes and hybridizing with the aboriginal cutthroat populations in the watershed, posing a threat to the, the rest of the uh, fish in the South Fork drainage. And biologists kind of got, got together, put their heads together, and created this objective um, goal of restoring and protecting native West Slope cutthroat trout fisheries by removing sources of introduced trout in these 21 headwater lakes. So to help guide wilderness managers um, achieve some of these, these objectives, the Arthur Carhart um, Institute developed these four principles. And the second and fourth are especially relevant to dealing with um, non-native or invasive species in wilderness, whether it's um, Napweed or blister rust, or in our, our situation, rainbow trout or Yellowstone cutthroat trout. But all of these present a particularly 
challenging set of circumstances that Wilkins made. I'm not going to go through these individually, but as we were developing um, the project planning and the environmental review process, we, we went through a number of the various alternatives for fish removal. Um, and ultimately, landed on the use of pesticides as a preferred alternative. And depending on the water that we were working in, it would be applied by you know, various techniques, boats or, or drip station or backpack spray. And alternatively, uh, another, another technique that's been used in some of these lakes is genetic swamping. And just briefly here, the concept here is you've got non-native fish, and by stocking genetically pure Wesso cutthroat trout on top of these populations on an annual basis, through time, through competition and hybridization, you're diluting out the non-native fish and ending up with essentially a pure Wesso population. So that proposal, needless to say, it, it attracted quite a bit of public attention and there was a lot of press um, around the discussion and controversy in the media. And a number of issues that, that the management agencies were grappling some of them, many of them listed here. Uh, some of the bigger ones at the time, West Slope were listed, listed for, or petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act, and there were questions around what this project would do or not do uh, to affect that management designation. Uh, questions around the effects of pesticides or fish toxicants, questions around the use of um, mechanized equipment in the wilderness, and effects to outfitters and neural fitter popular fisheries. Um, so after several years in the design and sort of public review phases um, through an adaptive management process, 15 of the lakes were treated with the pesticide road known, and an additional six lakes were managed via genetic swamping. And one of the, one of the unique aspects of this project is kind of the, the aquatic ecosystem-based approach that we took to pre- and post-project monitoring with the idea being that, okay, this is a, this is a West Slope Cutthroat Trout conservation project, but if the actions we're taking to conserve them is having an effect on the species that they rely on for food, then it's, counter, it's entirely counterintuitive. So we wanna make sure that the community composition is not affected by, by you know, the application of pesticides. So we do extensive pre and post treatment monitoring to document that. An additional consideration when you're working in a big landscape sure you're, you're conserving the genetic variation of the, the species you're trying to conserve. I mean, it's been mentioned a number of times tonight, these are big landscapes we're working in. The bog itself is almost 3,800 square miles. The South Fork Flathead drainage, close to 1,700 square miles. So you, you need to consider how that genetic variation is partitioned across the, the landscape for the drainage. And in the case of West Slope, you see really big differences from one watershed to the next. Additionally, you know, the, the close pro or the proximity of these populations doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be genetically similar. So the take home from that is if you're going to conserve genetic variation in West Slope cutthroat trout, you need to do that by protecting as many populations in, of those fish as you can. To put that into a bit of a context, I kind of use the example of dogs. So the amount of genetic variation within species of domestic dog that's attributable to differences among the breeds is about 20%. Looking at West Slope Cutthroat, the amount of genetic differentiation that's due to differences between populations is about 30%. And just think about how different dog breeds are in terms of their size, their strength, their tolerance to extreme temperatures or temperament. Um, so it's, it's, not, it's a non-trivial uh, detail that you need to be paying attention to. So to date, we've used four local um, populations within the South Fork as donor sources to refound these lakes after the non-native trout have been removed. Uh, Sullivan and Quantonkin Creeks and Lums and Danaher. And it's these differences in habitat that convey the genetic differences as these populations become adapted to their environment. And those are important things that we want to work to conserve. So 
But just to kind of walk you through what that process looks like, um, fish are collected either via angling or electrofishing. They're held in these streamside live cars until we get the appropriate number that we need to haul out. Then they're transferred to this really high-tech system of trash compactor bags and, and coolers um, loaded up with water and, and oxygen, put on ice, and then loaded on the side of mules and hauled anywhere from 10 to 25 miles out of the wilderness uh, to where we need the hatchery truck at the trailhead. They're then taken to Sokovia Springs, which is a facility in Blankenship, um, specifically set up for West Slope Cutthroat Conservation. And they're raised to maturity, spawn, and then those offspring get loaded up either in helicopter fish tanks or transported via pack stock, where they're put back in the water <laughs> Lots of people and groups to thank. Uh, we would not be possible without support from lots of folks and agencies. And we've got time for questions. So thank you very much. Quick question. Yes. Uh, the cutthroat uh, cut boat. Yeah, where do they fit into the whole scheme of things? They're, they're the product of interbreeding between West Slope Cutthroat and, in that case, Rainbow. Um, so Is that the hybrid that you spoke That's about? the hybrid, exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay, and you guys are introducing those mainly for, you know, to keep the population of them growing? No, so that, so we're trying to, we're trying to remove the hybridization threat or the hybridized populations place those with pure West Slope. Okay. So, so we pulled some big cut bows out of uh, the North Fork mm -hmm. last summer. Yeah. And I was so, curious, you know, how, how many of them were in there and, uh, you know, yeah, how prevalent they were becoming, how much you guys or whoever did release into those, into those streams. Yeah, well, the river was stocked with rainbow up until 1970. Can you repeat the yes. question? Can you repeat the question? We can't yeah. Yeah, well, it was it was basically the introduction of the of the rainbow into the, these streams with the cutthroat, and they kind of bred together. And now we have a species of cutbow, as they refer to them, which is cutthroat rainbow. And it seems like they're more prevalent now than they have been. Of course, um, they're also growing to huge specimens of fish. I mean, they're lots of fun to pull out. But I was wondering, you know, if that's what you were referring to as the hybrid genetics in these streams was the was that yes. the rainbow and the cutties coming together yes okay yep. yeah you're right there you've got rainbow and west slope in the interconnected flathead system and they hybridize just like they do in the mountain lakes of the south shore flathead and that's overall a good thing no yeah. no well if not if your goal is to conserve populations of west slope well yeah i was curious as to why yeah. they introduced so many rainbows <clears throat> it was a, it was a different different frame of mind back then Trout was a trout. It's a couple years ago, yeah. Well, this, yeah, stocking, stocking stopped in the river in 1970. Oh, I thought they uh, recently they did this. You stocked rainbow? Yeah. No, not in the not in the flathead. Okay, yeah. so the cutbow mm -hmm. thing, the cutbows have been around for some time. Yeah, they're they're the product of just wild spawning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And and there are places for cutbows. Montana, uh, Ashley Lake, Little Bitterroot, those are cutbow populations, and the department is maintaining those, and they're, they're placed in fishing, but if you're looking for a pure west slope, uh, it's below 20%, but what's the conservation level for high For the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's 20%. <laughs> yeah, so if you get more than 20% rainbow in a fish, it's no longer a cutbow. Right. Wow. And remember, Matt was talking about South Fork is half of what's left. Well, the North and Middle Forks are a lot of what's left also. And Montana barely escaped an ESA listing on cutthroat trout. And believe me, what we're dealing with in bull trout, you don't want cutthroat listed. No. The other thing is it's our Montana state fish. And what does it say for us as stewards if we let our Montana state fish 
again, hybrid dust that would exist. So there's places for both. Now, if we fully accept it, West Salt Cutthroat would be a great fishery. Cut boats in the right place would be a great fishery too, and we manage for both. I see. Okay. Great. Yes. One of the concerns that I saw listed there was the idea of the uh, trailing in Portugal. In Portugal. Anchor ship in the Anchor ship. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that? <clears throat> yeah, so Anchor Ship Lake, um, the hybrids were removed in 2015, and the following year, that lake was restocked with both West Salt Cutthroat and Grayling using the Red Rock Stream as the source of fish for, for that lake. And so, Monitoring there is ongoing, uh, restocking is ongoing, but yeah, that, that lake has both species of fish back there. The, the thought both in Rogers Lake and and actually Handkerchief and in other lakes, uh, grayling and cutthroat are somewhat compatible. Uh, you know, neither one is very harmful to the others. And Matt mentioned the red rocks grayling. That is the native vestigial grayling <coughs> down in southwest Montana. It's blinking out. Great fishing, but uh, produce but some real problems too. Yes, uh, I'm wondering how serious the conversation is about going to single hooks because I know a lot of people do that for a number of years now. And it's like we're really trying to push that. But. Yeah, so so that's something that that we're exploring. You know, and there's there's a process that's coming up, and it's and we're kind of in the scoping phase before our regulations are set on a four-year. So the next 2020 is going to be the next regulation setting process. And we got a lot of things like that that we're exploring. So, so we're seeing, like I kind of mentioned, I alluded to, the Forest Service is undergoing this wild and scenic uh, three forks of the Flathead River management plan, acknowledging that there's increases in use that's going on. How much use can our fisheries or our recreational rivers or our campsites, how much use can they accommodate? And as one thing that we have control over is the, the effects that anglers have on these fish. And so it is one of the things that we're thinking about. You know, like you, like you mentioned, many states have gone to this Idaho, uh, British Columbia, just north of us have single barbless regulations. And, and how that shakes out in the end, I guess I don't really know. But, but one step in the right direction could be potentially travel boats, right? So how many of us have fished with travel boats? I mean, all of us at some point. And all of us have probably had some sort of an experience where you bring a fish in and it's got one coming out through its eye and one through the top of its head. They're hard to release when it's like that. So, so is that a step that we might take to reduce, you know, something proactive that we can do, acknowledging that there's this increased use? Yeah, that, that could be something that we would entertain. But I will I'll bring up the other point. Uh, that's a common debate. There to date, to date been over 60 studies looking at the difference in survival between single and travel hooks and barbs and barbless. And to date, none of the 60 studies have shown a real uh, benefit to fish survival by using single hooks or barbless hooks. And so if you go with science, you know, it's not justified. Now, if you personally prefer it, but yeah, basically the department says, go ahead and do it. It makes it uh, easier to release fish. It's easier to come out of you or your photo too. But uh, depends on whether you manage based on science. Yeah. I'd say it's pretty much like Yeah, that. the big difference we see is there's a lot of hooking stars. Those don't seem to affect fish survival. A lot of the top dogs. Yep. Are, yep. They don't look as good, but they survive fine. So what are you going to manage for it? And it's a, it's an impingement on fishermen. So just that's the kind of debate you get into. Yeah. If we are interested in the single barless idea, how can we as fishermen? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, that regulation
information center process is coming up, and between now and 2020, we'll be releasing tentative uh, regulations, and that will be an opportunity for the public to get involved, voice your opinion, put out things like that that you're interested in, and uh, and you know talk to us as a department about that kind of stuff. So yes, Flathead Wildlife uh, will host a meeting with the regional fisheries manager Mike Kensler and the state management bureau chief. Roberts on April 10th at Fish Wildlife and Parks, uh, and we'll put out a notice on it. And uh, those are the two guys to talk to, and the whole discussion will be over fishing regulations for the next four years. So that's one option. It'll be open to uh, the internet for public comment also. Yes. Can you say something about the nicest shrimp to offer? <laughs> That's an entire seminar. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say they were, they were introduced in 1968, the year I graduated from high school. It showed you how long ago that happened. But go ahead. <laughs> no, it was a question. I had yeah. never heard anything about it. I'm oh. just curious. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Where have you been? <laughs> and it's not on Google. I tried it. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> that basically, um, you know, Based on Kootenai Lake, British Columbia, they were getting four pound coke. I mean, we had a heck of a fishery in uh, Flathead Lake. And of course, fishermen said, well, we want more. And when they looked up there, those fish were eating mice and shrimp. So rather than eat, eating, I'm gonna make it short, rather than eating pinhead stuff, they're eating big, big bites of mice. So the thought was, shoot, let's put mice in and the fish lands will roll. Uh, and they were introduced in about 100 lakes. Unfortunately, we found out that Kootenai Lake was a real anomaly. In most of the other lakes, rather than adding to the food base, they actually competed with coconut. Uh, and when you add in predators like lake trout that would eat mice to grow abundant and big, basically started crashing coconut populations all over the place. And I showed up just in time for Flathead to crash, so that was great timing. Uh, and so it was done with good intentions. It was done at the request of anglers, should have done our homework, and that's why now when there are introductions, there's a whole lot of environmental analysis to make sure you're not gonna get into some quirky effects like that. But it, it goes down as one of the big uh, science, uh, you know, write-ups of good intentions, but it went horribly awry. So, we'll talk more. <laughs> system as well, and where we have, for the last 10 years, we did a, a project using gill netting to try and remove lake trout from there. So there's a variety of ways that you can use gill nets. Uh, the most common way that we use gill nets at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and this is not unique to here, this is all throughout the state, is to use what they call, it's called an experimental gill net. And so it's 125 feet long, so they're relatively short compared to the size of something like Hungry Horse Reservoir. And it's made up of a variety of different sized meshes. So the idea there is that if you set these nets and you get a sample of the fish that's in it, and is it more of that? It's a lethal way of, of sampling for the fish. So we set these nets uh, once every couple of years, and uh, they're set in a standardized locations around Hungry Horse, so for this example. And we set them, and then the next day we come back, and it's got a bunch of fish in it of different sizes for the different mesh sizes. We take them back, and then we pick the fish out of them, and we measure them, weigh them, take tissue samples, It's meant to be a sampling tool in, in this case. So there are ways, like for commercial fisheries, where they're setting them out to catch as many fish as they can, or in Swan Lake, where we're trying to catch as many lake trout as we can. But in this instance, it's just a sampling tool where we're getting a representative sample of the fish that live in that lake. So all of these mountain lakes are referring to pure
questions? what are some of the other things that, that concern us or keep me up at night. I dread the day that um, we get a call that we have something aquatic invasive species related introduced into the Passaic Hunger Tools Reservoir. Um, and you know, we work closely with our co-managers at the Forest Service and, and others, the Park Service that's, uh, that's on our radar. So, yeah. From a bull trap standpoint, Yeah, but 